Okay, welcome back to my series of astrologer interviews. Today we're getting teleported to the Galactic Center to <laughs> <laughs> interview the Queen. Can I call you the Queen of Neo-Vedic astrologers? Well, my God, what an honor! Thank you. Yes. Good, good. I think that's a good term for you. <laughs> she's really deserves to be called the Queen because she's got the tenure. Right? <laughs> And she's got tons of experience. She was just telling me all about, I had to stop her and say, let's start recording because she has, she's been telling me all the stuff that's gold. <laughs> so let, let me start you off. Um, t well, should we, should we tell people about you or they already know about you? Cause you're already so well known. Oh, well, I didn't know that I was that well known. <laughs> I didn't. You're very well known. You have tons of awards. You have tons of recognitions. Everybody knows you. You're one of the most famous astrologers in the world, aren't you? Right? Wow. Uh, you know, I have studied for so long and looked up to so many people. For you to say that about me, I kind of like, it's, it's so humbling. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm, <laughs> no, not me. Who are you talking about? I'm like looking, who? Who is <laughs> talking about? Nope, it's you. <laughs> looking behind me. Where are they? Yeah. Yeah, it's you. So I think you really don't need an introduction. Well, thank you, Vic. That's so cool. Good. So tell us then. I want to know first from you, what is destiny? What is fate? What is karma? What is this thing? Oh, gosh. Don't we all wonder about that? I mean, that's like the biggest question in the world. What is fate? What is destiny? Mm. Why are we here? That's what got me into astrology, actually. I wanted to know what is the purpose of this? All of a sudden we're in these bodies and we don't know why. And then you go to school and they put you on all these religious classes that never answer any of the real questions that I had. So guess what? I, I got into astrology because I always want to know why something's the way it is. I know that's not very devotional. And I know that so many people take the path of devotion. They just believe and they trust and they have faith. And that's so beautiful. But I'm sorry, I ask too many questions. Mm -hmm. I gotta know why. Yeah. <laughs> and, I think, and I think that's what astrologers do. I think that's why I got into astrology. I want to, why are we here? Why are we going through this? What is fate? What is destiny? So. So, you know what? I don't think anybody really knows all of the answers. And I always tell my students, if someone says they know all the answers, run the other way as fast as you can. <laughs> but, <laughs> but from my experience, what I feel, because I really think everything's feeling-based, because I think when I, when I look at it, and Vedic astrology taught me this, when you look at the moksha houses, which are 4, 8, and 12. These are the houses that give you spiritual liberation from this world. And that's what we're all seeking, especially when we get into those times, those dark nights of the soul. We all will go there because we all experience death and sickness and loss and betrayal. This is all part of the human experience. So when we feel these things, we want, you know, where do we go? So we go, we ask, we pray. Because we have to feel like there's something beyond us that's more powerful that has to be directing such a play of emotions and feelings. But going back to the chart, if you think about the, the moksha houses, 4, 8, and 12, they're relative to the water signs. And what is water all about? Feeling. And I think so many times people, they feel in their hurt and they try to push these feelings away. And I believe that we are meant to process feelings. We have to feel to heal, you know? So in order to heal something, we have to feel it. Instead of, you know, all, all the today, you know, there's antidepressants, there's, you know, people do all sorts of things to escape pain. And nobody wants to be in pain, but we have to feel it to process it. And then once we do that, it's... You know, there's, there's awareness from it. And this is what I believe wisdom is built on. When you feel something and you understand why you feel it, that's the key, understanding. And I think astrology's really helped me with that, to really understand why we're feeling a certain thing based on the charts, based on the planets, based on the houses. 
it really gives, and everyone's different and everyone has a different experience. But overall, the mythologies of mankind are reminiscent in the charts, in the mythologies. And I know if you go, if you look at Indian mythology compared to Greek mythology, it's the same issues. I mean, Mercury means the same thing. Venus means the same thing. And we're all here to learn through the human experience to grow in awareness and consciousness, whereas moksha, where we are liberated from this world, but we have to feel. So that's the, that's the issue. And going back to destiny, what is it we're supposed to heal? Because that's what I think spirituality is all about that we're healing the human condition and understanding why we're here to transcend it and become and realize who we really are. And that is divine. Mm. So, I mean, I know that's high minded and a lot of people when they're in pain and suffering, that's not going to help. But I think to really recognize that the chart is going to give you an idea of what you need to learn through in order to grow and to evolve emotionally, become spiritually. Does Mm. that make sense at all? Yeah. In fact, you already answered. Now, by saying that, you answered another one of my questions, which was what's suffering and why is there suffering? So what I'm hearing you saying is like, you have to feel it to heal it. Mm -hmm. The water signs are the, the water signs are the moksha signs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's brilliant. And um, so that's what suffering is for then, isn't it? Because you have to feel what you're doing wrong in order to start to do it right, to move away that's from right. what's wrong, right? That's right, exactly. It's, so, all, it's all about feeling, really. So are you saying, oh, and I also thought that was interesting because you said that you're, you're not, it's not devotional to ask why, but then your answers to your questions of why comes from feeling. So that's actually yes. quite devotional. Yes. And sometimes, you know, because I have a really strong third house and fifth house, writing is a modality that really helps me because I feel like when I start to write, I sort of ask questions and things just kind of start coming out that I'm like, well, and, you know, you go back and you read your writing and you go, who wrote that? Uh Uh (laughs) You know, I I don't, that would not be what I'd write, but it's like a form of, of, sort of like channeling the energy from you know that's that's within us really Mm. you know we always want to look up and think you know the spirit the divine is outside of us but it's all within us and when we ask these questions and i i use writing because everybody's going to have a different modality mine just happens to be writing and when i write the answers come and it gives me the reason why that i'm always seeking Mm. So are you saying then that destiny is the, uh, the, uh, the chance for us to experience what we've done wrong and then learn from it? Is that what you were getting at? Well, in a way, but you know, when I really question what's right or wrong, it's, it can sometimes be different for some people. Mm. And I know that that's kind of off the charts, but there is this natural indicate. I mean, sense of feeling that we're here uh, all for to, you know, we all feel good when we do something good. Mm. And of course, to, you know, that makes us feel good when we help other people, when we uplift and empower. All these things are really empowerment. But, but to answer your question, what is our destiny? I mean, I think everybody has a different destiny. And I think mm. really what's going to evolve is our sense of healing our our human experience. And I think many times, you know, so many people are so into right and wrong and judgment. And sometimes, you know, we just have to accept that people are the way they are and that's healing. You know, that we don't have so many judgments about everyone else and comparing everyone else. It's just kind of like, who are you? What is your, what are your gifts? What are you here to do with those gifts? And it really does involve bringing in other people because, you know, we are here for the reason that we're here to help one another. We we are not meant to be a rock or an island, to be isolated. And so we have to learn how to come together and help one another and heal and grow together. 
And I believe, you know, as a human, as humanity, none of us really do evolve completely and totally till everyone has, because mm. we are all that oneness. We all have to come together as a team and help each other out. And I got to say right now, nobody's really coming together. So I know I keep going back to what is our destiny? I think everyone has a different destiny, but in the end, it's all the same. And that is to come together and help one another to heal, to evolve, to find that we are all one. I know that's the, you know, the classic, um, Led Zeppelin song when all is one and one is all but but the thing is that is really what we're all trying to achieve it's not like it's isolated I have this individual destiny which you know it feels like that but essentially we were, we are all working together and I know this is like beyond it's very high-minded and not very many people are coming back to the essence of of togetherness and being one as humanity to help heal and uplift one another. Yeah. And I think that's our destiny actually. Okay. I've got to I ask you one more question and I have to say, say something to make an observation. Uh, My question okay. is, are you a Led Zeppelin fan? I love rock and roll. Yeah. <laughs> I love the whole <laughs> rock and roll. All of it. Yeah. I would not have guessed. I know. I know. You know what? Looks, looks can be very deceiving with me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big Led Zeppelin fan. I love Led Zeppelin, especially that record, the fourth record. That, and remember, they had the Hermit from Alistair oh Crowley's cards. My favorite too, Hangman and all that. It makes yeah. me of the Trump cards. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I love it. And you know, uh, probably the Who is one of my favorites too. Oh, really? Yeah. Now, one thing about the Hermit card. Whoop! One thing about the Hermit card. I loved yeah. that card since I was a kid. And. Uh, and I, I've also been in rock bands, punk rock bands, and heart. I love that. That's so cool. We're gonna do a show in uh, where is it? Riverside, California. Uh, really? At the end of this month, like a reunion show, and the shirt that we're gonna have is gonna have the Led Zeppelin Hermit <laughs> with the, with our band logo in the red letters. I love it. That is so cool. Yeah. <laughs> I love rock and roll. I know. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and now also I wanted to make an observation about what you said about, you started off by saying, I know this isn't very devotional. And I thought that was odd because you look devotional, your vibe is devotional. So, but then you, you went on to say really nicely that the destiny of everybody is to unify and help each other come together. All of the, de all of the various fragmented individual destinies yes, yes. have this in common. But yes. that's, but that is bhakti, that is devotion right there. Well, thank you, because I always felt like I should be more devotional. What's wrong with me? But I just, I always had this individualistic kind of way of thinking, because I think being an astrologer, and especially coming from Western astrology, the planet Uranus is the epitome of who I am, wow. because it's unconventional, even though I look conventional, and, uh, and I never fit in, because, you know, even in the world of astrology, I don't fit in. Because they have this idea that you have to, I mean, let me just, let me just get real. Be yeah. the granola look. And I like makeup. And people <laughs> look at you like, what? <laughs> from coming from Dallas, Texas, being a Vedic astrologer. I mean, talk about you not fitting in it anywhere. That's kind of where I come from. But you know what? I kind of like that. I like being the odd, unusual, eclectic. Um, and I have Uranus stationary. I think planets that are stationary are will really define who a person is because that's the planet where all the planets are moving. That's the one that's standing still saying, hey, this is who you are. Mm. That's how powerful stationary planets are. Yeah. And I want many astrologers to have a stationary Uranus. Hmm. Mm -hmm. We were talking about that actually on our when we got together on Kapil's channel. How I know, I got excited when you yeah. said that because yeah, that's yeah. exactly what I was going to talk about and here you came <laughs> right up and you were right before me so you just kind of paved the way it was perfect <laughs> yeah so then what is happiness for I mean now I understand what suffering is for because it's to help me realize how I'm not coming together with the whole yeah so then what's happiness for happiness well as we know in astrology the fourth house is the house of happiness mm. 
And that always, that surprised me when I first learned that. I was like, how does that equate to happiness? Hmm. Well, happiness is a sense of security. Because when you feel secure and when you feel supported, especially by others, you're happy. Hmm. It is the feeling of isolation and loneliness that equates to feeling unhappy. And that, that boils right back down to the whole idea of what I'm presenting here. Feeling together with people. You know, my, my dearest friend in the 90s uh, passed away with cancer. And, and you know, I, I'm going to go ahead. The, the viewers here are going to be open to this. But this is, she communicated to me after she passed away mm. for quite some time in my head. And we were both runners and, you know, grow, uh, going to school in Austin, Texas, you know, we'd run town like I love Austin. Mm. And, um, and we just had the best time. And when, and I, when I would run after she passed away, I would talk to her in my head. And this was back when we had the headphones where it was like the radio. And so one day I was, I walked out and I was getting ready for my run. And one of my neighbors came by and she said, I don't know, we got talking. I said, you know, I talk to my best friend when I run. She talks to me in my head. Mm. And she looked at me like I was a three-headed monster. <laughs> oh, my God, I am crazy. Maybe I'm making all this up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I went on my run, and, you know, usually I would, you know, music would come on that would, I'd ask a question, and she would answer me in analogies and pictures. It was unbelievable how she would communicate to me. And so then I finally asked her, I said, okay, Lynn, if you are really communicating to me, make the song Closing Time come on right now. And this was a song that I associated with, with her death and mm. at the time. The minute I said that, that song started. So I knew that I was in communication with her. Mm. So my point is going back to your question about what is happiness? See, in these bodies, we are separated from everyone. But when she explained to me that when we pass on to the other side, we become one with everything. She said, that is the most natural way of being, to be one with everyone. You're connected at all times. But when you're here, she said, it's like you're under the water, this density, and you're separate and isolated. And when you're separate and isolated and you can't connect to other people, that creates fear, that creates all sorts of sense of, you know, mental disease, because we want to feel one again. We want to feel connected. And that connection is with, you know, let's just, let's just call it the divine. So when we feel that we are connected with the divine, we're, there's bliss, there's happiness. Mm -hmm. And that means everyone, that you're connected to everyone because every, everyone is a part of that divinity. And that's our natural state of being, unity, not separation. And that's what, where we are here in these bodies, in this consciousness. Yes, probably. Did I answer your question? Totally, and I'm so happy that I'm doing this interview with you. <laughs> Because like you said, you know, you have an appearance which is different than your soul, yes. than your mind. I don't know about your soul, but it's different yeah. than your mind. And that's yeah. great too. That's also so important. Yes. It's so cool to not look like, I don't like when people just imitate external things of, of stuff, you know, and it's good when somebody's just themselves, I'm going to bravo you for that and Thank bravo you. you for what you just said. And I'll, I'll add something. Uh, there's Ditti and Aditi. Diti is, these are some of the wives of the prajapati, the, the progenitor. Mm -hmm. Diti is the one who creates the daityas. And the daityas are the guys who cause trouble. You know, like Rahu, Ketu. Right. They're daityas. And Aditi is the mother of the Adityas. Those, that's the sun, Surya, Vishnu, all the, all the forms. So in that little story there there's a lot of information that goes along the lines exactly the lines of what you're saying because what does ditti mean ditti is the root of the english word division mm -hmm. and aditi means non-division it means uni unification yes. so that's what love is that's what happiness is togetherness it's so nice but i have a question okay the fourth house 
that makes so much sense to me. It's watery, it's inside, it's, it's the family, it's the home, it's where the togetherness happens, it's the roots. And, but that's a moksha house. Now let's compare with the eighth house, which is, starts to feel isolated, and then the twelfth house is totally isolated. But mm-hmm. there are also moksha houses, but they're also not so happy. Right. So can you say anything about that? Oh my gosh, yes, because I, I love talking about the water houses because what I think it's all about <laughs> is the 12th house, I mean, the fourth house, first of all, represents home. So what that really equates to is our eternal home because I loved, I love talking about the Wizard of Oz, you know, where it's all about returning to our home. You know, in the Wizard of Oz, she says there's no place like home, and that's all she wanted was to return home. Mm. And in the story, I think it's the most amazing symbolic story because here's the the Tin Man, the, the Lion, they're all searching for things that they think they're lacking. Mm. And she's searching to go home again and searching out the Wizard of Oz and all that. And of course, what they discover in the end is they already had what they're searching for always within them. Hmm. And that relates to the sense of the, the spiritual eternal home. We're there. We have that within us, even though we're always looking outside. And that's what life is. We're looking outside of ourselves for that which we already have. Hmm. And when we return to that, it's the, it's the experience of returning home. Hmm. I'll never forget. There was this, um, the, uh, I can't remember his name, but he wrote a book about going to the side and coming back. And he said, you know what, you know what, what it felt like when you were in that tunnel? He says, have you ever gone away to camp and then you return back home? That's what it feels like when you're getting, going <laughs> out that tunnel block. You come back home. And that's so important to understand. That's our essence and that's what makes us happy. And that's our emotion. But talking about the eighth house, mm. now the eighth house is... And the 12th house, they're both the houses of loss or death, as you want, to, as many people want to say, because that's the total endings. And actually, did you know the fourth house is called the end of life? So they're all about endings and returning to our eternal oneness. But the eighth house has quite a different story because I call it the house of control, power. And I say, okay, if you're if you're at a party, what are the three things that you you're it's it's just taboo to discuss? Death, um, your money, and what's the other thing? Um, Religion. Death, pardon? Yes. Religion. Yes. So you don't talk about that sex, you know. <laughs> Otherwise, unless you you want to just completely everyone you know kick you out. But the thing is about these taboos is these are how we control one another through money, sex, and religion, because religion is like, oh, you're going to go to hell if you don't shape up and follow the way I'm telling you to go. Mm. So these are all control mechanisms. Mm. That's what the eighth house is about, control and manipulation. So people that feel like they have to control everything, when they come to the planets transiting or natal planets in the eighth house, they have to learn that to surrender, to let go of their need to control. And that's what opens the sky to the divine or opens your heart to find that oneness that, or that eternal home, that connection. Because these are what these houses are about, is this eternal connection of the feelings, the emotions. They return us back to our home and connect us to the divine. Whereas I think the 12th house is the most spiritual house of all. You know, they say the ninth house is. But I think the ninth house, it's, it's spiritual, it's laws, it's spiritual law, which can mm. sometimes people can get caught up in the righteousness of the law, who's right. right, and all of that. Whereas the 12th house, hey, you come along with life and you come to the end and you're on your dying bed, guess what? You don't care about the argument you had with so-and-so at some point. You're ready to unite with the collective unconscious, to be one with all that is. And therefore, I call that the house of forgiveness. Or the, the word I really like to use is acceptance. To accept the way things are. Instead of fighting it, the eighth house, you're fighting it. You're always trying to be, you know, in control. 
The fourth house is the house where you need to get that sense of security. It's scary being here because we don't know why <laughs> we're here and, and, you know, we feel disconnected. So I guess what I'm trying to say is these water houses, you feel a disconnect from the world. And remember, these houses are the houses of what is beyond this world. Mm. You know, it is not a part. And the reason why I tell my students, you can't understand the eighth or the twelfth house because what you're trying to understand are things that are not of this world. How can you define that and understand it while you're here in this body? You can't. So the fourth house has more of a sense of feeling safe secure and so many people don't especially when they have malefics in the fourth and that's what they're striving mm -hmm. for throughout their life mm -hmm. but all of these houses are really about i guess what i'm trying to say is finding that sense of unity however it may be and that's what connects us and that's what's liberating our soul to really discover we're already there we have that connection to the divine but there's so many things in this world that make us feel like we don't and i think all three of these houses are a part of that i call the 12th house the house of the great escape why because everything about it is about how we escape this world mm. whether, whether it's through prisons hospitals sleep meditation, ashrams, vacations, foreign countries. How do we escape this world? Death, the final, the final uh, you know, transition from this world. But these are all ways that really we can have a sense of being in this world, but not of it through these houses. Hmm. And, you know, when we sleep, we get to leave this world for a while and come back. And you know, I always tell all of my clients and friends, use your dreams to connect to what you need to know. Because at that time, you are connecting with um, your subconscious that knows everything. And you leave the, this plane. I always think that each day that we go to sleep and we wake up, it's just like another life. Because when we pass on, we go to the, the other side. But then we come back just like every day that we go to sleep and we wake up. Mm -hmm. So it's all symbolic and, and reminiscent of the whole process. This is all a process. And, you know, if you, if you consider the first house as our birth, as we come into the world head first, it rules the head. And as we evolve through, through you know, our coming together with our siblings, then our parents, then marriage, then all the way. And, you know, it's just like that in the, in the nakshatras, the, you know, the marriage nakshatras. Then you come to the bhadrapadas, which are the funeral cots. It's all this cyclic process of, of human beings as we evolve through our life and process and come to an understanding and accept why we were here and what we came here to experience so that we can have a better understanding of remembering who we are. That's all a process. And I believe this whole life here is like a dream. You know, we, it's like a dream. It's all the illusion, but we have to understand that this dream has a purpose and that may come back around to our destiny and i think our purpose is we have to learn to work together and find that sense of unity and oneness and find that that is what is consciousness and the divine all within us that's that's Great. my that's my belief i mean you can have a different belief but that's what that's basically Vic, what i have experienced through the struggles of my life we all have struggles but that's what I've come full circle to understand. And astrology is my tool of understanding. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It's, I think it's more than a belief for you because it's, it's an experience. Yeah. And I want to say, I want to comment on something that you said and then I ask you a new question. Okay. Like, I, I like your analysis. It wasn't exactly an analysis, but I like what you had to say about these water houses. And what I'm taking away from it is how they're all about how we can dissolve, because they're watery, right? So water is dissolving. So we're going to dissolve into this unit. But they're, yes. because of their placement and position, you know, relative to the horizons, they've got different aspects to them. So the fourth house was 
there's some support, there's some help. How can we dissolve into this family unit? Mm -hmm. And then the twelfth, I think, is how we dissolve our ego, how we dissolve our our separateness. Mm -hmm. And then the eighth was like, how I don't know. That was an interesting one. And I, I, a lot of the things that you were saying about the eighth house were new perspectives for me. How it's control, mm -hmm. manipulation. Well, and another thing about the eighth house is the eighth house deals with disgrace, humiliation, and shame. Okay. And if you have a lot of planets there, you know what I mean. I do have and, a lot of planets there. Okay. Well, <laughs> it, it, you're going to experience that. But what yeah. I told my clients, especially when they have planets there, you have overcome the most incredible spiritual obstacles with planets in the eighth house because what comes out of that is, humil is humility. And I believe if you've experienced humility, you have rid yourself of enormous mountains of karma. <laughs> to come to this point of humility is so important and is so healing. And it's, it's off the charts incredible in terms of, of ridding yourself of past karma. <laughs> you know, Joni, when we, before we started recording, you were telling me how you, a lot of what you're going to tell me is not from, you know, it's not from reading books or quoting books or something from your experience. But I love that because I do a lot of reading books. I'm kind of like uh, Mr. Opposite of you yeah. in, some, in some ways. But yeah. um, so everything that you're saying is the same thing that's been written I, in classic isn't books. It beautiful? <laughs> yeah. I know. That's so wonderful. And some people go, you know what? I, you know, and I feel. At some points, you know, I studied all the all the Vedas. I studied all the, you know, the Brihadhar Shastra, all of the texts. And then after a while, I was just like, I just do readings, and I and some of the things work that I that you know I studied. Some of them don't, but I've I've just in in accordance had my own philosophies from all the experience. I say, I'm an astrologer that's in the trenches. I do readings and lots of them. Mm. And it's experiential more than the reading anymore. I don't have time to read the books. I yeah. have, you know, I'm doing readings, but it's a whole experience. In every single chart I do, I learn something new. Mm. I mean, how powerful is that? Definitely. You know? Definitely, definitely. Okay, now we're at a party. There's three things we're not supposed to talk about. One of them is... <laughs> No, 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 we have to talk about this now because <laughs> we talked about happiness, we talked about love, but then you mentioned sex is one of the things that's in the eighth house and it's a control mechanism. So do you have a negative impression of well, sex? Well, you know what? You think about it. There's so, I mean, it, it captures and motivates people. I mean, what sells movies? Sex, right? So it's like, it's this controlling force that overcomes people. And there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot out there. The eighth house deals with addictions. It can deal with all kinds of addictions, you know, whether it's sexual, alcohol, drugs, it's obsessions. What, and, and what is an addiction? It's like, it's like this. It's like a food. It's like overeating and bulimia and all that. They're trying to be in control. When somebody feels like they can control what they eat, they feel like they're in control. But the more you try to be in control, guess what? The more out of control one becomes. But, but talking about going back to, to sex, I mean, in businesses, I mean, people control each other through sex. So, you know, some people rise in the corporate ladder through that. Or some people get movie parts because of that. Or, you know, are directors. But there's so much control going on with this and even when you're married you know people are going to control each other what through sex it's true you mm. know and maybe it's unconscious but it is a part of our society and world and what people do is that did i answer your question though yeah yeah you you backed up your claim okay <laughs> so, <laughs> but so uh, yeah okay good you're the first one you know everybody yeah. else who i asked about sex they give me some positive thing about it Hey, you know what? It's what people, it's one of the things that people control each other with. Now, you know, it's, and another thing, when you talk about the sexual experience, it is like, I think, it, well, in French, it's like called union. It's like the little mort, the little death. Mm. Because really, you know, essentially what it's about is 
becoming one with someone else. Mm. But in the process, you got to, you know what? There just is not in this world. I wish I could say it's true, but there just is not unconditional love when it comes to this. Yes, you know, you may feel bliss and happy when you're one with someone, but then there's all this controlling stuff that comes along unless it's dealing with unconditional love. And mm. we're just not there yet. Yeah. I we don't know what that really, really, really is. We talk about it, but... You know, unconditional love means you love someone no matter what. And that is probably, um, I think that's the beauty of having children. I mean, children teach us unconditional love. What a beautiful experience. I have three sons, and I can't tell you how happy, happy that has made me. Because, Mm -hmm. I mean, my sons are, they're incredible. And it brings me such great joy to have unconditional love with these kids and, and, and how they've grown and what they've developed into. I mean, what joy that is. Yeah, I agree. I have three kids too. Oh, great. One of them is on the <laughs> other side of the camera, sleeping. Oh, oh good. <laughs> so if you hear any strange noises, that's her. Uh, great, great, great. So, hmm. Oh, yeah, I wanted to ask you about your last name. Is it French? Yes. So yes. your background is French? Do you know, do you speak French? It's my husband's name. So oh. and yes, he, was, he was born in France and uh, he speaks French. Uh, huh. And um, his father was bar- brought to the United States uh, to open up a restaurant because he was a famous French chef. Oh, wow. So I was impressed with him. Of course, I got Venus conjunct Rahu, right? I like foreigners. Yeah. <laughs> and I was impressed because... Um, I, all this fabulous French food impressed me in high school. We actually met in high school. Oh, wow. <laughs> We've been together since high school. Oh, so, yeah. I've read that somewhere from you. You married your high school yeah. sweetheart. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, so, I mean, that, that was the thing that, that I thought was just great and fabulous was all that uh, incredible food. and. <laughs> <laughs> You fell in love with the food. They said the man, the way to the man's heart is through his is through his tongue. Oh no, it's it's the way to my heart. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I mean, what is one of the joys of life? But food. I mean, really, <laughs> I love food. Sex is for controlling people, but food—that's love. Oh yeah, that's love. <laughs> that is true, heart. though. That is true, isn't it? Food is such an important intimacy that oh, people yeah, share. We- I mean, all of our family gatherings, everything's about food. And what do we do while we have one, one meal? We're talking about what we're going to have at the next, next meal. meal. <laughs> it consumes our whole life. And look at the second house. You're, gonna, you're mixing, those things are all mixed together. The family, the happiness, the stability, yeah. and yeah. food, nutrition. You know, astrology is just so perfect. It teaches yeah. us everything about what our life's about. It's, yeah. it just, it's perfect the way it all lines up. I love it. Okay, I got one more question for you. Okay. We have time? Yeah, we're going fast. Actually, I like interviews that are, I don't like things that are long and rambling. I like things that are short and sweet. I'm with you. So I got only one more then. You mentioned about, you talked about death. A couple of times you mentioned death. It's the, the final transition. And you, you, had, you had been in communication with somebody who, who had died. So what is this? What, tell, like, tell me more about what death is. How does it affect me? Who am I? It's also related with like the who am I question. I know. Death is the biggest enigma of our life. And everyone fears it because nobody really knows, has gone to the other side and stayed there for a while and come back. Yes, people have been through the tunnel and then, you know, then they come back. But, you know, this is... You know, this is probably one of the things that everyone's so fear. Of course, we're fearful of death. I don't care who you are. And a lot of people, yeah, at a certain point, you're tired of life. And as we get older, you know, you've been there, done that. And you're just kind of like ready to move on. What's the next stage? And I'm only telling you what I think. Because no one really knows. No one's ever gone there. And, and from what my friend told, told me on the other side, is that we're you know we're eternal and we cannot with our with our limited consciousness and limited minds understand the totality of of who we are and what we are but i have to think that our whole universe is all third third fourth dimensional it is part of the materialistic plane 
But, you know, this, this is, you know, to, to give you an idea of where my mind goes, I'm just kind of like, I'm always thinking deep stuff, like, and about astrology in the universe. And I believe that these points of going to different dimensions and planes, which of course, that's what happens when we die. It's like going through a black hole because black holes, they suck in everything and the scientists say on the other side are other dimensions. And it's just like in the death process, we go through a tunnel and a hole to another side where there's a completely different energy and light. And yes, everything is a vibration here and it's very dense and slow vibrationally here. But when we go through that vibrational change to the other side and we're in this different vibration where everything is vibrating at a higher frequency and who knows how many dimensions there are. But I believe that there's all these different dimensions of energy and everything is energy and everything's vibrating at different speed. But we, trans we transform into something entirely different. And I believe that that's where we become one with all and feel this oneness. But with our minds, with our consciousness, we are so limited. And all we know is beginning and ends by birth and death. And it's more than that. There is no beginning and end. It just can't be. And the totality of infinity and unbounding awareness and consciousness it's way beyond what we can fathom and think of. But I, I think while we're here, I mean, it just makes sense. The thing that feels the best to us is that sense of love and connection. And that's what we have to seek and find. And I think sometimes when we look into different religions and things like that, that's what separates us. We can't let things separate. We got to find a way to you know, and that's why, why you have gangs, that's why you have ISIS, that's why you have all the things that make people feel a connection at some point. Those people are trying to find a connection in a very unconscious way. That's really what we're seeking is togetherness and connection. And when we feel that, I think we will evolve. And you know, it's like this whole cycle of Kali Yuga and, and the, and the um, the ages of mankind, the you know age of Aquarius and all that. It's all these evolvements, but these are still a part of the physical plane. What we're really aspiring to is to get beyond this. And I think we all come here, this is my opinion, we all come here to grow and learn through the experiences of what Earth is giving us, which is never gonna be utopia. It's never gonna be perfect. We come here to grow because it is difficult. Everything is always dying. You know, it's like, I think about, you know, you always gotta be coloring your hair. You always gotta be <laughs> finding everything. It's always like your house always, you know, things wear down and you gotta rebuild and you gotta keep doing things here. Mm. It's, it's hard, mm -hmm. but it's what we're here just in order because of the hardness to grow and our growth is what we take with us. And it's like this, when you're on your dying bed, you don't worry about an argument you had with somebody and you don't wish that you made more money or that you worked harder. You always wish that you spent more time with your loved ones. That's everything. Family, and I, and I love one, something that Ram Dass said. I quote this all, all the time, because this is my, my belief. It's like Ram Dass says, so you think you're so spiritual meditating three hours a day and being a vegetarian. Go spend a weekend with your family and let's see how spiritual you really are. Hmm. And you know, that's the way we have to come from. It's not about controlling, just controlling all these things that we feel like we can be in control of. It's through really our spiritual practices as we connect to everyone and each other. I just got it. I just got it. I just understood. I just understood what you're saying about the eighth house. Okay, tell me. <sighs> because the eighth house is, you know, city. It's the yoga city. And what are those things? Those are just fancy ways of controlling. Yes. You know, yeah. Okay, I got yes. it. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. And I'm totally with you with the liking that Baba Ram Das statement. My whole wow. thing too, you know, I used to live in an ashram, temple, India. Well, nothing made me a better person than having a child. 
Yes, I agree. Yeah. And it's, you know, and if you have the, some, some difficult issues with your family, we are with these people to heal, not to run away, to heal and heal our emotional issues. Remember what I said, healing the emotions, feeling it equates to healing. Mm. And that's why we're here. That's my, that's my ploy. And, you know, hey, I'm just trying to learn too. But this is my philosophy. I love this interview. I'm so happy that we did this interview. Thank and you. now I can't wait to see you. We're going we're gonna to be in the same place at the same time in November in Sedona for I that know. conference, right? I look forward to that. That's going to be great fun. It's gonna be great. Let's make sure we spend some time. We will. I'm sure you're going to be busy, but give hey, me some okay. time. We're going to have fun. I can't wait to see everybody. Okay. This, this is like unity, bringing everyone together. That's what I'm all about, right? Yeah. So what do we do when we want to get a reading from Joni Putri? Well, I guess you can go to my website, which is galacticcenter.org. And I have a university that I certify uh, my students in Vedic Astrology. It is a very intense course, and I work with people hands-on. And my website for that is universityofvedicastrology.com. Okay, great. I'll put those two in the, you know, so you people can click them. I'll put them in the description of the, on the video down when I put this on YouTube. And I'll thank, I really want to thank you. And also I'll make a plug for my own book. If the people love these, um, and if people really like the interviews that I've been doing, because it's different okay. than most interviews, because people are ready for some philosophy and some meaning of life. So I, I've written a book called The Beautifully Rational Philosophy, philosophy of Astrology. If you like mm -hmm. these interviews, you'll probably love that book. I'll put a link to that book also. I would love that. And yes, and I'm going to put this on my, uh, this interview on my Facebook and let people know about what you do as well, Vic. Thank you, Jen. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Look forward to our next, next time and our next interaction. Thank this you so much. Fun. Thank you.